What is up, everybody? And welcome to this special in-between season episode of PopStream. I am your PopStream host, Matt Slater. You can find me at Maddie Slay on Twitter. And with me is our other host of PopStream, Tajan Campbell. Hi, all. So excited to be here. Yes, we're not quite in season two yet, but we're getting there. We're getting close. (laughs) <laughs> and we are here for a really special interview today. So today we are interviewing Fred Van Linty and Crystal Skillman. Uh, I got both of those correct, yes? You did. Yes, excellent. Um, the authors are the creators of King Kirby, which is a new audio drama available on podcast services. And we're going to get all into that. But first of all, uh, Fred and Crystal, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Who are you? What do you do? Well, we're beaming. We're, we are appropriately beaming into you from some sort of cosmic yeah. sphere with this J.J. <laughs> Abrams lens flash we've got going on here. It's I very, love it. I love it. It's, it's the the sunlight. This is like a real uh, Tomb of Raw situation from Raiders, where we actually have the, <laughs> the light is coming in at this time of year. Just it'll go. This will go away in a couple minutes. No, it just adds drama. It just That's adds right. impact to what you're going to but say. we will find the treasure. That's what you're saying. Well, we are <laughs> celestial godlike beings who roam the earth, bringing imparting you, wisdom, imparting wisdom, and bringing the the st- true tales of comic book history to you, the listeners and viewers of the world. Fantastic. So, Fred, I know that you're you're a comic creator. Yes. Yes. I, Is that I, your your main billing? How do you bill yourself? Yes, I am a comic book writer. Uh, I dabble in other things like novels and plays. Uh, the plays most often with this this young lady here. Uh, Hello. But uh, <laughs> I worked for Marvel for many years and wrote uh, Amazing Spider-Man and Iron Man Legacy and Marvel Zombies and Taskmaster and Deadpool versus Punisher and Slapstick and uh marvel adventures fantastic four power pack i mean i did a lot of them you know yes many characters created or co-created by did the eternals i did an eternals annual so lots of characters created or co-created by jack kirby fantastic and then lately you've been doing a little bit more um or maybe not lately but within that career you also have some history focus right with action presidents um comic book history yeah comics. yeah i do a lot of nonfiction comics in fact uh my very first marvel comic and my first nonfiction comic action philosophers number one came out on the same day oh fantastic back, back in 2005 right. so they've kind of been multiple tracks going on and so with Ryan Dunlavy, we've done the comic book history of comics. Um, we just wrapped up, uh, well, actually, it's still coming out from IDW. We just finished comic, comic book history of animation. Oh, very exciting. But we've also done action philosophers and action presidents. Um, and we're talking about doing some new stuff. Oh, that's exciting. I can't wait the to hear about that in the future. So good. The animation comics. I can't wait for you to read them. It's really, really special. I mean, I love the comic book history of comics. So if it's going to be in that vein, if it's like that informative, is that kind of what it's going to be? Well, the animation one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, just, awesome. it's a companion piece. It's sort of the same style. We have the same colorist, Adam Gozowski, who's terrific. Um, and IDW has been, been really great to us. That's awesome. And uh, Crystal, you're a playwright, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, yep, and I, and I write. And now, uh, you know, we've kind of... Uh, you know, comic book writer, playwright, and then Red started to write plays and I started to write comics. And so it's, it's our houses piled up with different uh, media and different ways of working. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm known as a playwright. I wrote a play called Open that um, happened uh, a couple of years ago that um, has reopened uh, work for my plays like Rain's Always Save the World and Pulp Verte, which was just shown at the Playwright Center. And then I'm the book writer of a lot of musicals. I'm the book writer of Mary and Max, the musical, um, which has had two showings overseas and um, it's getting optioned and it's based on the black and white claymated uh, film by Adam Elliott, which is a really beautiful film. Bobby Cronin um, is the composer of that. Bobby Cronin did the com- uh, composition for King Kirby, the audio drama, which I know we're going to get into. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so comics, and our comic book is Eat Fighter that we've written together. On Webtoon. Um, yeah, and uh, there's an educational component to a new young adult uh, comic book that we're kind of batting around too. Um, so, yeah, I, I like writing in all mediums, but known as a playwright, non-similar to Fred, who's known as a comic book writer, but also writes novels and different things. 
this is so fantastic. My undergrad is in theater and then I transitioned to education and teaching after that. So I'm just like, my nerd senses are, are tingling a lot right now. We'll try not to go down too many rabbit holes. That's me. And Otasian's like all in that same area. <laughs> all those, all these questions. I'm like, oh, let's talk about the relationship between music and what is it like to write the book and all of these things that <laughs> have nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. So if I, if I start going down too many rabbit holes, Matt can give me, give me a look. Oh, I'll be right there with you. Uh, <laughs> to a completely different conversation, and and we'll talk about that too. Don't so, worry, musicals can always be involved. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, I just on the latest episode of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, they were talking about like a cop drama musical, and I was like, oh, who did that? Why? <laughs> oh yeah, cop rock. Cop rock. Yes, cop rock. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I was. I'm old enough to have made fun yep. of that as a child. Yeah, I remember cop rock. I remember. What? I think there was a whole climactic sequence in a in a courtroom, wasn't there? Sure, there were many yeah, climactic probably. sequences in the court. So this was like an her. actual thing. I thought it was oh, yeah. just some yeah. random thing that they oh. pulled for this story, but people knew. No, about that it. was an actual Fox yeah. television show called Cop, Cop, Rock. Cop, Cop Rock. Cop Rock. That That's was cool. trying to combine MTV music videos with like Hill Street Blues with like a yeah, like a whole they're like nice. a Hill Street. They're like yeah. a Miami Vice, Miami probably Vice, more. Yeah, more. Yeah, like it I was all order. Maybe. I don't. I don't know. I would watch that. I would. I would have to. I would have you, to watch that. I'm gonna that. have to find it. <laughs> but I feel like once you were subjected to it, you might develop. It live up to the potential. <laughs> well, we can't forget that they made a Spider-Man musical. So if we need to find a crossover, that's where it is, right there. We just now everything we've talked right. about is connected, and it's it's on topic. That's right. So you all created King Kirby, which originated originated as a play, an off-Broadway play, correct? Right. Yes. And it's just been released as an audio drama. It's on podcast uh, platforms. Um, so it's all about the life of Jack Kirby, which is a huge influential, uh, you know, the, the king of comics. Right. But for those who may not know who Jack Kirby is, could you give us like a brief description? What is his influence? Why is he important? Sure. I mean, Kirby's life kind of goes throughout the history of comics in the 20th century and the 40s. He co-created uh, Captain America with Joe Simon, along with Boy Commandos at DC and a bunch of patriotic comics. The the most obvious sort of salient fact about Captain America comics number one, obviously, is that famously Cap is punching Hitler in the face on the cover, which was very unusual for comics in those days because it was such an overtly political statement. You know, Hitler is rightly, you know, become synonymous with evil. You know, his name is being synonymous with that in our day, but in his, you know, in, in 1941, he, you know, he still was was a was the head of state, right? And, and people were worried. Martin Goodman, as he says in our play, really did what did wonder. Well, a he was worried that he would get sued by him. <laughs> I I remember hearing that, yeah. And I was yeah. like, why is that what you're worried about? I actually was looking at the. I, I downloaded the first issue of Captain America, and it was funny because it does say in the beginning, like any references to real people living or dead are completely fictionalized. And there's like Hitler on the very, you know, right. the front cover. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that probably doesn't apply to Hitler. But uh, it, uh, you know, Captain America was not the first uh, patriotic superhero. In fact, the shield from Archie, back then known as MLJ, had appeared four months beforehand. Uh, and in fact, as you may have noticed, also in Captain America Comics number one, Cap shield is triangular, not round. And that's because, uh, and that's partly because probably Joe Simon maybe ripped off the shield a little bit <laughs> <laughs> uh, in order to do Captain America. But uh, but then Archie threatened to sue, and so that's why they changed the shield to to round hmm. to get MLJ slash Archie off their back. So that was sort of like a case of lawyers doing something that you was want to mess with Archie. Yeah, a little <laughs> accidentally helpful. Because I think we can all agree the shield works much mm -hmm. better as round as a frisbee than it does as a spear. I don't I can imagine him chucking it at people. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not not as effective. Different visual there. Yeah, exactly. So so Gat Parker wasn't the first superhero, a uh, Pytrax superhero. He was not the, the last, but you know, he was the only one with the word America in his name. Mm. <laughs> Although uh there's another gag in uh in the play about uh Joe Simon answers the phone and says, Timely Comics, home of USA Man. I forget. They came up with a bunch of other like knockoff, like rip off <laughs> Com Captain America characters like USA Man and, you know, <laughs> patriotism dude or whatever. And Joe Simon says, except no substitutes. <laughs> oh, it's a cute little joke. 
Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, it's a very big deal. It launched it. It also, because the, um, because Martin Goodman was worried about, he was worried about being sued by Hitler, but also simultaneously he was worried about Hitler being assassinated because he was in such a volatile situation in Europe that he wanted to rush out Captain America and one as quickly as possible. So that, you know, again, as depicted in the play, Kirby just basically, you know, I don't know how much coffee Kirby drank in his lifetime, but if I was him, I would have just, mm-hmm. just guzzled it yes. and just <laughs> through 60 pages of Captain America. That's partly why Kirby was able to develop such a dynamic style was because he was, was, was working so quickly. Because of the coffee. Well, <laughs> because, well because of the crazy deadline. Right. Yeah. I remember, you know, when he went back to Marvel, he was talking about how many pages a month he was going to have to be doing. And I was like, Whoa. yeah, that sounds awful. Yeah, at, the, at, the t- at, the, at the top of his game, he was doing nine pages a day, which is bananas. Like these days, you're lucky to get a, a page every two days. <laughs> from, yeah. I got the sense know. of that, too, with his wife. The first thing she asks when he comes home is your hand okay? And just the significance of that as a joke that your wife would make, but also as the reality of yeah. that. Can you still make us money? Too. Yeah, that was, that was a direct quote. That was from a letter that she wrote or uh, huh. Kirby said. So that was, that was. Uh, they that really was had rude. these letters. Yeah. 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 Um, which we have like a little sequence with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, then he went off and fought, actually fought in France in World War II. Uh, so he's like one of the few superhero convoys who we actually know killed somebody. They draw fighting all the time, mm-hmm. but you know, remarkably few people have actually killed anybody. And uh, and then he came back and with again with Josephine created young romance and a lot of the iconic romance comics of the late '40s, early '50s that Roy Lichtenstein and later pop artists used as sort of the big iconography of that era. And then he kind of bounced around once comics got in serious trouble. Um, through the Wortham purges uh, and that whole scare in the 50s and wound up at Marvel where he worked with Stan Lee and did Fantastic Four, Hulk, Thor, Avengers, the X-Men, Iron Man, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. All the ones that the kids love these days. Yeah. That's right. The universe you know today, the Marvel universe. Had a significant hand in creating Spider-Man, although... Dick, Steve Ditko was the main sort of driving force there. Um, but then um, sort of fell out with Stan because Stan really had this uh, burning need to take credit for everything. Went to DC, went back to DC for the third time. I didn't even mention the second time you went to DC. That's <laughs> Green Arrow and Challenges the Unknown and a lot of other things. Uh, he went to DC where he created uh, The New Gods, Dark Side, Mr. Miracle, the demon, my personal favorite, uh, Commandy, and then ended up back at Marvel for a third time. So yeah, three. So started out Marvel. Okay, right. Back at Marvel for the third time, where he created the Eternals, Machine Man. He had a very lengthy run on Captain America again. Um, his third run on Captain America. Uh, that time, that's when he was paired with the Falcon mm-hmm. fans of the Falcon. Uh, uh, upcoming Falcon Winter Soldier series. Um, so if you're a fan of a comic character, there's a pretty big yes. chance that Kirby yeah. had his hand in it somehow. He's He is without question the single most important figure in superhero comics, period. I think it's the simplest way to say it. Um, and, and we haven't even mentioned Wanda, um, and he's a that's true. Vision, but he created Wanda. You know, yep. so everything you see right the now vision, on TV. The Vision we know from Wanda Vision was sort of based on a '40s Vision character that he and Joe Simon created at the same time as Captain America. Although the the Android Vision is much different. And then he spent a lot of the '80s fighting with Marvel, trying to get his artwork back, because Marvel was sort of using his artwork as a as a bargaining chip to uh, make sure that Kirby signed away all of his rights. Um, Kirby died and I believe it was 92 or 93 and, uh, his heirs ended up suing Marvel and Marvel ended up settling. I should say Disney settled with them before the case could go to the Supreme court, mm. which I think all corporate owners of entertainment were, uh, pooping their pants about because, <laughs> you know, if the, the Supreme court did in fact, I mean, this court is so pro-corporate. I don't know how Kirby could have won, but that's just my own personal political opinion. But anyway, they didn't want to take the chance because if the court had a precedence about work for hire, then a lot of these properties that they make a ton of money off of, you know, they would have ended up going to heirs of various creators. And like the week, 
I think yeah. that our show came out was when Disney settled with the Kirby family. When the original show came out. Right. And thank you. Yeah. In 2014. Yeah. 2014. Okay. Yeah. So that was one of my questions is that this was originally written as a stage play. When I first heard that it was going to be on podcast services, my first impression was, oh, we're going to hear people talk about Jack Kirby, much like you just told us about Jack Kirby, right? That's right. what I was expecting. And then of course, when you get into it, it is an audio drama. It is a radio play, right? Fully produced with sound effects and everything. What inspired you all? Oh yeah. Tijin. I just wanted to say too, it's an audio drama that starts with the emotion and the connection with the character immediately. Like in listening to it in that first episode, as I sat down, I was struck by how much you're instantly almost in this conversation with Jack Kirby and what that does to allow you to resonate with his story throughout the other four episodes, other three episodes was really, uh, it was, it was more engaging and, and more inspiring than like Matt had said, when I first thought that it was just going to be people talking about it, that opportunity to get to hear his narrative was really great. Right. I think I was shocked. I hit play and then you get stereo audio. Like I'm used to my podcast just being mono and it's like the sound's moving from side to side. Revolutionary. But uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what inspired you all to, to turn it into an audio drama? Well, we actually uh, it's it's been it's a little cult hit in a lot of ways because it had um, originally six performances, one to eight. It was a festival. So they they added on a few and um we were blessed with a beautiful New York Times rave, but really we were just about to close. Um, and at the same time, we were like, how do we share this with our uh, Kickstarter backers and all these sorts of things? And, um, uh, you know, Fred had this great idea of recording audio. And so we did that. And this was the second- For our time. Kickstarter backers. For the we, Kickstarter because backers. Because we, we funded the original production through Kickstarter. And so we wanted to give the backers, you know, a chance to actually hear the cast performing mm -hmm. the show. And this was like 2014. And so we ended up um, the uh, doing this take at a comic book store in Midtown Comics that hosted us. And they were actually going to put it, uh, put and it on their podcast. And they taped it and all that stuff, yeah. And, uh, and we had such a great time. And there was a lot of magical things that came together the actors were coming off of this performance it was a few months later but you know when you really connect to characters like these actors did you know it, it still lives in you it, it, it came into gear there were it kind of went into high octane with these microphones and there we, many of our cast are great uh, voiceover actors are known for that work as well including Steve Rattazzi who is the voice of Dr. Orpheus um, and Venture Brothers and so you know, the, the work was great. We were proud of it. And then it really became um, kind of a pandemic project in that someone said, hey, I think this could be a great audio drama. We're like, wait a minute. I think we have that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, the idea to bring in Bobby Cronin, who I've worked with on, on musicals before, and really give a score that gets you into the inner thoughts of Kirby, which is there structurally. And in the play, it's very moving too. some people who know Kirby cry when they come in because you, you see him drawing. But here we wanted that act of, of the listening and hearing him draw and feeling like you're in his mind to be reflected by the music and sound um, uh, within the storytelling of these episodes. So it all just ended up being this great audio experience. At the same time, we began to do some scripted audio work. And I think we were excited to play with the audio form um, I love that plays are becoming audio dramas so much. It's great. Um, and, and, uh, but I definitely wanted it. Like when I saw that when Fred realized these could be episodes, I got so excited because I thought the idea of it being a series, the idea of, because if you go to a play and you sit for 90 minutes or so, you know, that's really cool. I want to bring you through that. I don't feel like my audio experience has to be that. And I'd rather you come back and I'd rather you think about it for a little bit and all these things. So it really has turned into an experience. It's so great to hear you say that, um, that, that, that is, brings you into his world. Um, so we, we did a lot of crafting with structure, I guess, and uh, design, sound design um, with Bobby, um, which he did masterfully to create this specific audio drama experience. So all the voices though, all the, the, that was all originally recorded back in 2014 and you yes. just kind of molded those into this drama. Exactly. Yes. Well, into what we, it was already a drama, but you molded it into the, the high production value that, that we get now. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, the Brian folks at Midtown Comics recorded this. We did add some minor sound effects. Uh, in the original version, you had me, you heard me reading stage directions. Mm -hmm. So for this version, we cut me out. I think we redid all the most, if not all the sound effects, added a bunch of music and added a bunch of new sound effects. And so, yeah. And so I think tweaked it a little bit like, we added like a con, like a con announcer in one scene mm -hmm. in the last one of the last scenes mm -hmm. and just made it more, you know, more of a, a seamless kind of dramatic 
um, you know, storytelling as opposed to, you know, scene five. <laughs> but the <laughs> script office offices, you know. The script is intact. You didn't really have to make too many changes. No, I don't think we changed nope. a thing. Uh, there were some challenges with sound design in something that was uh, super visual, what you would see. But one of the things I found in scripted work and in tackling that challenge is if you've written something super visual, you probably got a good sound with it, right? Because it's that these things go together. Um, but the, the proposal sequence was something that that Fred had to kind of think through with Bobby. I mm, think. Right. Yeah. But I, everybody gets it, you yep. know, because he does, yeah. never says, you know, will you marry me? You just kind of get it from the audio. You know, because in the show, he pulls out the ring and she says, I do before he can ask her. She says, yes, 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 yes. yes. She says, yes, before he can, <laughs> he can actually ask her to marry him. Uh, and so we didn't. So that was really the only sh part of it. I mean, the show is very fluid and, you know, was in the black black box, essentially. So it mm -hmm. had, had minimal setting and minimal pr uh, props uh, and costumes and stuff. And everybody except for Steve Fertazzi, who plays Kirby, had like a do played like a dozen characters. So sure. it really lent itself to to this audio space. Um, so were, was there an audience when you recorded this originally? Cause you said it was at Midtown comics. Were there people watching when these lines were being recorded? Four or five, you Helpers, know, friends. There, yeah, there were people who worked at Midtown who were kind of like either helping or just kind of wanted to hear it and just kind of hung around. So sure, not yeah. really, no. So, why do you think that this is such an important story to tell, right? Obviously, there's lots of history here. There's some really intriguing things. Um, there's a lot of content for someone who's interested in the MCU and, and comics to dive in. But why is this an important story to tell? Well, I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting story because, you know, people you know, generally don't care where their pop culture comes from. They think it's sort of cranked up by a factory. And I think it's important for people to understand that real human beings do this. So to, so to me, it's really almost like a labor story, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a story of working people. Uh, and we have a real tendency in this culture to really put down working people in a really offensive way. And I just think it's important to sort of raise some of these folks up to be the heroes they truly are. Especially in the arts. Especially in the yeah. arts. Absolutely. Yeah, it's seen as that, like, and it's kind of addressed a little bit in the play. So, so often the arts and even the comic arts are seen as like, oh, it's pulp, it's filler, it's not yes. important, right? Um, right? But clearly it has such a huge impact on so many people that that in and of itself elevate, elevates it up to that level of importance. Well, and it's art that's literature, you know, that's a lot of what the, the, the function of what you're doing. And um, uh, my pre-Fred comics universe was when I was like a teenager or late teens, I... I I saw maybe early twenties. I saw Mouse, um, the original uh, the graphic novel, in framed at MoMA, and room after room, the, both books. Um, and I remember always uh, appreciating graphic or, or novels, but I don't think to, I did to that extent where it was like that. That experience was revelatory. And um, to come back to to this, you know also drawing is storytelling. So when we get into the meat and bones of what the story is, um, in terms of the drama of it, you know, we have two, two creators who see things very differently and, and, and how that happened, but we're really focusing on the life of Kirby and then meeting this individual and what that becomes, which who is obviously Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. um, but it also really wonderfully brings you along on that journey of, you know, what is writing? What is storytelling? What is creation? Um, and when you are um, making a panel with all the action and someone's just maybe mentioned a couple words to you for maybe part of a page, I mean, you yourself are telling that story. And so, um, you know, and what is that value and how does that come back to pop culture and, and legacy? And I think one of the reasons why this is such a moving story is that you know, sometimes the person knows their worth and they're fighting for that the whole time. I think what makes Jack such an incredible um, character in person is that he, of course, is super confident and and um, boisterous. But at the same time, he just wants to dream and he wants to to create and share. And he's in the beginning of an industry that didn't even know what it was. Like in one scene, he's like, comic books, what's that? Like, and it's, it's like, it's brand new. You want to try it out? And he's like, yeah. So like, you know, there he's at the birth of something. And, uh, and when we get into the Stan Lee talk about that, like he had, I love how Fred puts it, you know, that he just he really did, 
didn't understand how this person could say that he made them because he knows the work he did. And uh, can I can I steal your line, or do you want to say that about the X Men? I love what you say. Um, yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's, um, I just it's, it's it's literally like Kirby has been quoted saying, um, um, you know, Stanley doesn't know what a mutant is. He doesn't. <laughs> He doesn't read science fiction. He doesn't know what, like, how could, you know, how could you believe him? You know? So, you know, he, it was really coming from uh, so much of his soul that I think that he, he was just, he just couldn't believe that the person standing next to him would, that the public would say, Hey, you know, that guy created everything. Um, and, and there's a, there's an argument to be said that in the beginning, like, yeah, bothered him, but he, he was engrossed in working. Um, and so there's a lot here too about his family and, and, um, his growing sense of understanding the importance of that and also his wife and that relationship. So it really is about an artist's life. It's really, I guess we're just so passionate about it as two artists that live together or are passionate about the arts, um, being, being jobs as well. I'm a teacher with the theater development fund, I teach how plays work and how comics made from up, like Fun Home the Musical works, how King Kirby works. And, and one of the things that I just love is when teenagers' eyes light up, they're like, I can do that. I was like, Yeah, you could. Th this is this, what I'm teaching right now. You could use this and write a video game. Like, mm -hmm. what? Oh my gosh, this is a job. And I'm like, Yeah, this is a job. Like, if and, you're lucky. If you're lucky, you know, but <laughs> there are many parts of this job. Maybe you work in audio, maybe you work for Audible, maybe you, I mean, like, you know, there's a way to do what you love and figure out what part of that and component you want to want to do. And so, um, so there's a lot in King Kirby that is about that. And I hope pays homage to the fact that he himself was a really great mentor to many, many artists, which is why I think he's mm. got um so many people wanting to hear his story, even though Stan was the bigger figure, he uh, had a lot of Padawans, shall we say, that learned from studying him, um, wanting to be like him or taking his artwork forward in a new direction. I think that's what I enjoyed most about the audio drama was the humanity it brought to the character. And also that you get to see how much of his life played into what he was creating and how, you know, often we take pop culture as like you had said, something that's kind of created off screen, we don't care about the creation process, but the the reality of he went to war, he was talking about and exploring things that he had experienced. He was exploring things that he wanted to experience with the sci-fi pieces and just the the human nature of it. Right. That's yeah, the the not to give too much away because I want people to listen to it, but the final scene between um, Jack and his wife where she's talking to him about his value and you know what he brings, that almost brought a tear to my eye. It was very, very touching. Um, and kind of going off that value and what you guys have talked about um, with Stan Lee and kind of that relationship, you know, I feel like in the comics community, there's a rising awareness about, you know, how much Stan Lee contributed to some of these stories in comparison to Kirby. Um, and you addressed that a lot in episode four, starting kind of in episode three, but a lot in episode four of the drama. So how did you decide to tackle that? I mean, are you guys fictionalizing these conversations? Are you drawing upon, uh, you know, recordings or eyewitness accounts? How do you choose to handle that? Well, um, you know, this has been something that's sort of gone back to the 80s, back when Kirby was fighting to get his artwork back. And, you know, there's been a recent uh, biography of Stan called True Believer that our friend Abraham Rose Reisman wrote, wrote, excuse me. And in it, he makes clear that, you know, the, the historical record, what historians like to have, you know, uh, documentation of, of a lot of Stan's contributions are, is pretty much nil. Um, you know, we know that even before the Marvel stuff was created, that the typical way that Stan would work was he would um, at best type out a two page synopsis that the artist would then have to break down into, you know, actual pages and draw pages. You know, I am actually writer. work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I write scripts like screenplay, you know, write, draw this in this panel. And then so-and-so says this, the line of dialogue. There was none of that in, in mm -hmm. the Stan Lee days. Um <laughs> Hello. Which is what we call the um, Marvel method. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah, it was generally called the Marvel method. And then the um, 
the artist would then bring the art into the Marvel offices and then Stan would add the dialogue, which is not an inconsequential thing. You know, Stan had a very particular way of writing dialogue. He was talking to the readers in captions. He was talking to them in, in sort of his editorials and, and then letter column. So, you know, that's why Stan sort of is Mr. Marvel because he was sort of the continuity on every, regardless of who was drawing the comic, it was always Stan's voice you were hearing in your head as you were reading. So yeah. that was very mm -hmm. powerful and important. But when it came to things like, you know, like Wally Wood was, was a legendary artist who quit Daredevil. He's one of the first artists in Daredevil because he realized he was writing, essentially doing what I would call writing, you know, and he would put in the dialogue in the, in the panels. And, but Stan would only take all the credit. And this is also important. Stan was also picking up the paycheck, the page rate mm. for writing. So, you know, some guys like Wally Wood, like Steve Ditko, creator of Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and, uh, and Kirby f ultimately got fed up with this and quit, you know, Kirby stuck around the longest, but then he had created the most characters. And so he had the most to lose by quitting. Um, and, you know, as, as he found out later, particularly with the uh, artwork, he really paid a price for it. So do you think that Kirby's contributions and kind of his struggles here have been influential obviously his characters and some of the the works that he's created have been influential but his kind of fight to get back his artwork and all the different things that happened with the rights to to his work um do you think that's been influential on comics or pop culture in our modern age yes i mean i don't think i would get royalties for my Marvel work, if it wasn't for Jack Kirby and the struggle of people like that mm -hmm. and the struggle of guys like Neil Adams who fought to get Siegel and Schuster credit and compensation for, um, do you want to be in the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> we right. welcome pets. We welcome children. That's right. He, uh, <laughs> he likes rubbing his, he's a cat. He likes rubbing his face on things. So if you're only yes. listening to this and you hear weird scratches in the microphone, that's because our cat is. <laughs> So for all of our audio listeners, that's what's going on right now. With his face, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, we've been doing solidly three weeks of these podcast interviews for King Kirby, and this is the first time he's suddenly decided for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. he's, he's We're honored. Say, he's going to have a close, good, good, close personal relationship with the microphone. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, that was part of a whole sort of 80s movement, you know, Frank Miller was somebody who was very vocal about trying to get justice for jack and a lot of while those creators ended up you know doing creator own stuff like sin city and hellboy and you know a lot of those great creator own works here in america wouldn't really i mean they, they were possible but they wouldn't have been as um prevalent i think and happened as soon if kirby hadn't had to fight to get his artwork back in such a public fashion and i think all sure. this conversation we have especially now in the pandemic is we're all creating um i mean the story kirby story very much you know, it's so great to hear the story in the pandemic because we're at a point in our lives where we go, why am I doing what I do? What am I passionate about? How, do, how does this work? Everyone's so, reevaluating, yeah. <laughs> everyone's reevaluating. And so it, it, because you're on a life journey where someone's saying, you know, I think I've been exploited. What does that mean? Like, I, you know, I'm yet I want to keep creating. And, and what is that? So this conversation about IP that we have with all the works that we're creating, or if you're creating a new kind of work in the pandemic, maybe you're trying an audio drama for the first time or, or something like that. And you're weighing the possibilities of writing a story for someone and they own it or owning it yourself, which is more independent, but you have the IP, right? Or sometimes a mix. Um, depending on where. And, um, you know, it's, it's, everyone is, is starting to understand that owning the property is extremely valuable and important. And it's a value of yourself and your work and what you're doing. Um, or if you're going to give it away that you understand you're giving it away and you can make your peace with that. Um, so, so there's a lot in this conversation about art and work that's very valuable for artists to think about. And it's something that also has gone over uh, pretty minutely in, um, comic book histories of comics. I mm -hmm. feel like it really kind of hit the nail on the head about what it meant for work for hire and the dawning of that and re rebelling against that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it's funny that you bring that up because I, that's like my comic book textbook is that's how I know my comic book history. Um, I think that yeah. this audio drama King Kirby is, you know, it is so engaging and interesting to listen to that. You don't have to be a comics fan in order to enjoy the story that's being told. Right. Um, but for an average fan or someone who's really into the MCU, um, do you think they need to know anything before they dive in? Or do you think this is a good starting point to kind of learn that history behind these characters that you love? 
before they dive into King Kirby? I don't yes. think so. Yes. It, I think it's a pretty self-contained story. I mean, this guy's life is just kind of amazing. You know, like, I, I don't, I, even if you could give, you know, even if you could care less about comics, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, we really, um, and it was great to see how it um, sound-wise works in the audio drama, like like we were talking about, really connects you. Um, but also in the play, you know, there were a few drafts of this play, and Fred had written a whole draft years before he we had an opportunity, and then I started giving notes, and he put my name on it. And I was like, oh, we're, we're working together on this, and it was <laughs> I dragooned her. Yes, it was great. I do that to my husband all the time. I'm like, oh no, you're you're involved now. Uh, That's right. Get on, get on board. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, you know this. I knew him working at the table would be very exciting. But and I believe it was Fred's idea of starting with the auction, which you know, in which we really are brought into the fact that these priceless pieces of art are being sold at a, at a price that he will never see and. And I think any audience member is instantly, you know, into the dramatic question, which is how did, you know, how did that happen? And how can he let his worth be taken from him? And was it? And like, what is that? And like, so then we, we explore that story. So because it's framed that well, that with that way, I think anyone is intrigued. Some people have actually called it a pop culture um, death of a salesman because it has a working class kind of um, questions and um uh, between art, family, life. <laughs> Work, and you do, yeah, I can totally see that. At all ages, too, because you see him, I think, starting at age 10. Um, uh, and Stephen Rattazzi does a great job. You also see Nat Cassidy go through several ages and Joe Simon as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really neat to see to see that. And Roz, of course. Joe Mathers. Joe, Joe Mathers, <laughs> yes. So I listen to King Kirby on Apple Podcast. Usually when I listen to my podcast, I'm at the gym, I'm cooking dinner. Quickly realized this was not the way to listen to King Kirby. How do you suggest that people listen to King Kirby? Um, yeah, we uh, the great Rob Sockwitz, the, the, the journalist, did. Uh, we actually have an upcoming, there's a fifth episode coming out. Uh, fantastic. Uh, that is going to be a roundtable discussion with the cast and crew. And Rob... Oh, says that he was listening to the podcast while working out and he injured himself slightly <laughs> getting so involved in the story that he wasn't paying attention how many reps he was doing and pulled a muscle or five. So don't do that. Kids. Don't do that. <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, get a bottle of wine, sit down on the couch, you know, sure. make sure you can focus, get an old timey radio, put it in front of a roaring fire. There you go. I like that. It's like an old time thirties or forties kind of radio production. I, I do my have my parents had friend. records of those that I used to listen to when I was a kid. So this is sort oh, of all very right. natural for me. And I, I like, um, I have, okay. Cause of the pandemic, I bought something that can hold a camera that you can move so you can be free for all. I'm I mean, out. like uh, the cool people had this before I was $15 <laughs> and I like when this all went down and I finally went in the store, I was like, I'm going to get this. <laughs> and it was like, Oh, it's $30 with the light. I was like, I don't need this light. And so, but what I love is that like, it's like this robot arm I can put anywhere. So I actually put my phone up while I'm doing the dishes or something else. And then I just press play and I just play it out to the room or like, I love, I love, and I guess you could just do that with, um, you know, talking to your robots or whatever. But I always think that's the most fun is that it's kind of surrounding you while you, um, you know, do something. And I do have to say, it makes you want to, now we, you know, we can Google everything, obviously. So, you know, you just it, anything you hear, you know, just look up the images too, if you're interested in like, I mean, you don't need them to, to when you listen to the audio drama, but it's kind of neat because you will probably come off of being like, huh, I'm going to scroll or take a look at that cover again. Where can people find and listen to King Kirby right now? Well, anywhere uh, you get your podcast, it's on uh, Apple, Google, Spotify. You can go to the Broadway. It's on Broadway Podcast Networks. You go know, to the website. And if you really think you would like Broadway Podcast, their Broadway Podcast just this week launched an app you can get from the uh, Android and Apple stores and download and, and King Kirby and all of the uh all of the fine shows at Broadway Podcast Network are available. On yeah, and they have a lot I, of musicals on there. It's really fun. I found it on Broadway, the network, and I'm so excited to go back and find more because I started the podcast and then as it was playing, I might have also looked at the sidebar and been like, oh my goodness, <laughs> there's so much more here too. I'm so there glad I is. found this website. They made that app for you then. <laughs> yes. And it's available for free, but if people wanted to yes. support this work, what uh, could people do to do that? Um, well, you know, we also have a social media presence. We have King Kirby Play on Insta and on Twitter. Um, and so we try to put engaging material on there and, you know, uh, 
facts about Kirby and things like that. So please follow our, our books and or plays are for sale at Amazon and all fine. Yes. I am. You, can't, you can purchase the script, right? Yes, on Amazon. on Amazon. Um, and as well, um, let's see, you know, uh, I'm at uh, Concord Theatricals, used to be Sam French, um, and uh, uh, Drama's Play Service in terms of my plays. And let's see, that's, that's the most upcoming. It's really plays right now that you can buy. Um, and I'm proud that the audio dramas are, are free. Um, so. are, the right rights, are the rights to the play available to purchase if someone wanted to put on this play? Yep. Yeah, they just have to get in touch with us. Um, uh, we have like, you know, different, we have so many, we have lawyers and agents, all sorts of things. But what, all, all that one does is uh, they just say the number of performances and, and and that would be, it could be live streaming, it could be whatever. And then we would just uh, do a simple, simple contract. Very, very easy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome.